Uh, so welcome everyone uh, today. It's great to have you here. Uh, this is actually the um, 10th in our Language Technology and Data and Analysis Laboratory or LADAL webinar uh, series uh, for 221. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with an acknowledgement of country uh, because this is um, being organized out of the uh, University of Queensland, which land, uh, lays on the lands of the Yagara Durable peoples across the, the river here. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of the university, the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands in which we meet. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and to global society. And this, these are the links uh, to Liddell, but you can find them easily. Um, or online, if you look up the DAO. Um, oops, sorry. And so today, um, it's really my great pleasure to be introducing Dr. Simon Musgrave. Um, he was a lecturer uh, in the linguistics program at uh, Monash University until the end of 220, and now he's an honorary research fellow uh, down there. Um, and he's done a lot of work in his career so far and continuing to do great work now uh, with the various grants research grants that he's involved in. His work focuses in, uh, in linguistics and sociolinguistics, um, and he's been a real trailblazer in the use of computational tools in linguistic research and the relationship between linguistics and digital humanities for, for actually quite a long time. Uh, and that, that interest is continuing in his current work um, as the engagement and partnerships lead in the Language Data Commons of Australia, or LDACA, uh, project. So today, Simon is going to give us a gentle introduction to networks. So very much looking forward to that. So I'll pass across to you, Simon, now. Thank you, Michael. I'll share my screen. Um, so thank you to Martin and Michael for the opportunity to give this presentation. And thank you to everybody for coming to listen. Uh, Michael already did one acknowledgement, but in this distributed virtual environment, I'll do my own one. So I'm talking to you from unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. So what I'm going to talk about today is networks. And when Linguists think about networks, I think the first place they go is social networks, and they think about the kind of wonderful research that was pioneered by people like the Milroys in Belfast and Jenny Cheshire in England, which correlated sociolinguistic uh, variation with how people behaved in their social networks. I'm actually talking from a rather wider perspective here, talking about networks as a way of looking at data. And it can be data about social interactions, but it can be other kinds of data as well. And the kind of overall theme that I'm going to be pursuing here is that if we think about this a bit creatively, there are actually probably quite a lot of ways that we can use this as a tool and a powerful tool to assist us in our research, particularly in producing easily comprehended visualizations of quite complex situations. So uh, what I'm going to cover, and sorry, before I also before I go on, I should add, I'm by no means an expert in this field. So the kind of perspective of this talk is, this is something which I think is interesting. These are the kinds of things I've been able to do from starting from scratch and with not that great a technical capability or background. And so the idea is I'm hoping that I can encourage other people to think about applying this method to some of their own research. So I'm going to talk at least very briefly about the basics of networks, about what they are and what we can do with them. Then I'm going to look at a couple of examples in some detail, one of which is not really linguistic at all. It's a kind of classic example of social network analysis, which is to do with the uh, early 19th century English intellectual figure, William Godwin, 
and who he had meals with, which may sound not that exciting, but no, it's actually quite interesting. And then I'm going to go to a more linguistic example, which is looking at lexical choices in different groups of texts and how that can be represented as a network and what kind of insights we might get from that approach. So in those cases, I'll go through in a little bit of detail. I'll go a little bit under the bonnet and show you a little bit, particularly in terms of how you produce visualizations of this kind of material. Then I'm going to talk about another couple of examples from my own research, but in rather less detail. And just giving you a general idea of the kind of problems there and why this was a useful approach. Uh, and one of those examples looks at uh, what kinds of patterns there are of multilingual borrowing in a public library from a very culturally and linguistically diverse part of Melbourne. And the other one looks at whether we can find out anything about or whether, in fact, we can establish the, the existence of communities of practice in grammatical description. Are there certain kinds of things that people do if they belong to certain communities when they're writing the grammar of a language? And then at the end, um, I'll just talk a little bit about other possibilities, a couple of other research projects I'm involved in where I can see possibilities and encourage you to think about whether you can see any possibilities in anything you might be interested in. So the basics. If you start reading any kind of theoretical literature in this area, you'll find that although most, a lot of the time people talk about networks, they also talk about graphs. And you know what's on the screen is what we would usually think of when we hear the word graph. This is the kind of thing that we all drew when we were at school or at university and maybe still do. Um, we show relationships between things in, in a visual representation. But for mathematicians, graphs are much more varied. They're actually a whole field of study and they're formal objects in their own right for mathematicians. And basically anything that can be represented as, as a set of nodes or vertices, which are linked by edges or sometimes called arcs, anything that can be represented in that way is a graph. And it has formal properties for mathematicians that can be discussed in various ways. Um, and there's one further little nuance that comes in here. The arcs can be directed or undirected. So you can specify that a relationship between or the link between two nodes has only one direction, or it can be just a link without any particular direction to it. So these are the, the, the basic properties of graphs as far as mathematicians are concerned. Seems very simple, but it's a large area of research. There's considerable knowledge being developed about these objects, considerable discussion of subtle mathematical points. We're not going to worry about that, don't worry. But what is interesting is that one aspect of studying these, um, these objects mathematically is thinking about ways to represent them visually. So a network is a network on a page, it's straightforward, but you can do refinements, you can think about ways of making it more comprehensible and um, what's the word I want here? Uh, yeah, just clearer. So we'll look at that a little bit as we go along. So it just occurred to me, I should mention, you know, this is, this sounds quite abstract, but it does relate in surprising ways to things we might be interested in. Um, Michael may or may not recall this, but at the time we were working together on the Australian National Corpus project, we had some discussions with um, a wonderful scholar from the United States called Nancy Ide, and she'd done considerable work on the idea of annotation on linguistic data as directed graph objects. It was a way of formally modeling how you created annotations on linguistic data, which I must say I, at that point, couldn't get my head around. But now I've thought a little bit more about networks, I'm beginning to see that actually that's maybe an interesting way of approaching a problem like that. 
Okay, so that's the kind of very basic ideas of networks and graphs in terms of mathematics. But as I, as I said, what we're really interested in here is that this is a way of, that allows you to make really good visual representations of quite complex phenomena. So how might that work? Well, often what we're interested in is some kinds of entities and the relationships between them. And that can be modeled as this kind of graph, as a network. The entities are nodes and the relationships between them are the edges. It's not that complex, right? But it, it's, it's a certain level of abstraction that you have to bring to what you're working with. And then if you can see that it fits that way, then it's possible to start working this way. You can create this kind of network and you can then apply various kinds of analysis if you want to. So the point I've worked around to, I hope here is that for any kind of research where we're looking at relationships between entities or groups of entities and the relationships have a certain level of complexity, looking at them as network may be a way at least to explore the data and to find patterns in it. And therefore it's a worthwhile tool in our methodological toolkit. Now, as I kind of mentioned at the start, this has been often taken to be really applicable to relationships between people and groups of people. As, as I said, in sociolinguistic research networks have played an important role, but we're talking about social networks. In the first example, I'm going to look at that's what we'll be examining, but then I'm going to go on to think about other kinds of relationships between entities, which we can think of in the same way, that are to do with the behaviour of people possibly, but are not actually about the relationships between people themselves. So, um, when we've got information in the form of abstract network, a set of nodes, a set of entities, and a set of edges, the relationships between them, then we can produce visualizations and we can learn a lot from the visualizations. They show us the kind of stuff that's going on. Um, an example which prop pops up now and again these days is um, the beautiful network visualizations you can get of social media use. People produce these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful graphics which show who tweets and who retweets and who likes and so forth. And it takes enormous quantities of data, like millions of individual social media events and shows you the patterns. And that's the kind of power that we can get from network analysis. Although I'm not going to be looking at anything on that scale. So the visualization can show us the basic structure of the network and can show what kind of things are related and what kind of things are not related. It can show us different types of entities and what kind of relationships they have with other things in between them. And to some extent, at least, we can look at different types of relationship. Are the relationships between one pair of entities the same kind of relationships as those between another entity? All of this kind of stuff can be represented graphically when we use network analysis tools. And we can also represent the strength of relationships and the importance of entities visually. We can make things bigger, we can apply heat colors to them and techniques like that to give an indication of things that are more or less important. So we can pack a lot of information into, as I said, quite easily comprehended graphical representations. Now, if we want to start doing this, there are very good software libraries available, which are um, which exist for various programming languages. The one that I have been using and which will pop up on the screen at some point is called iGraph, which is a, a library which you can use in R, 
as I do, but you can also use it in Python, you can also use it in C++. So it's, it's a useful one if you're interested in exploring these possibilities, because it's once you know how it runs, it's agnostic as to the environment in which you're working. You can run it from different platforms. Um, there's also a good piece of free software called Gephi, which you can use for this kind of work also. And I will demonstrate it briefly at one point. It's, um, it's kind of cool because it lets you see how different algorithms will lay out your data in real time. I'll show you an example of that when we get there. And that, that's, that's fun. That's the kind of thing that I just sit there and go, oh yeah, I like this. I hope you will too. So what kind of data do we need when we're going to do this kind of work? Well, standardly across these tools, you need two tables of data before you can create the graph object which you're going to analyze. So you need a list of nodes, a list of entities with unique identifiers. So the code has to be able to pick out which one is which with a unique identifier, which can just be a number. And you can relate a number to a more um, a more meaningful label if you want to. And then you need a list of the edges. And these are always just pairs. They link two nodes and they only link two nodes. Now, this doesn't mean that you can only have one link between two nodes. You can have as many links as you want, but each one has to be listed separately. So if classic example of um, multiplexity in a network, if two entities are linked in multiple ways, then each of those links will be a separate entry in the edge table. Okay. Now, exactly what the format of the data is, is a little bit different from package to package, but essentially it's the same. You have two tables and they have these particular properties. Um, so, you know, there's Gephi, if you likes an edge list, which is only numbers. In iGraph, you can put other things into your edge list and it will work with them. But the essential idea is that you have the edge list links pairs of entities and the entities have some kind of identification. In theory, um, you can use iGraph to automatically generate node lists. I'm really cautious about this stuff and I don't do that. I, I always like to have a separate data table, which also means that if I want to work in Gephi, I can just transfer pretty easily. Um, so these, this is the basics of the data. You need two tables and they one lists the entities, one lists the relationships exhaustively. Okay, so let's start having some fun with this stuff. As I said, the first example I'm going to look at relates to a guy called William Godwin. And William Godwin was a significant figure in the intellectual life of London, at least, from around 1790, from around the time of the French Revolution, through to his death in the 1830s. To give you an idea of his importance in this uh, environment, we can note that he was married to Mary Wollstonecraft, the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. So um, Godwin's circles were definitely radical. He was seen as on the radical end of politics, but he was deeply embedded in that environment. So you know, Mary Wollstonecraft's book is one of the first important works of feminist uh, philosophy, and he was married to her. Uh, she died young in childbirth, but they had two children together, I think, from memory, one of whom married Percy Shelley. So Mary Godwin became, or Mary Godwin Molsoncraft, I can't remember how she called herself. She became Mary Shelley, and she, of course, is the author of Frankenstein. So you can see that he, he had very good connections in the intellectual world of London. The other reason why he's interesting to us here is that he kept a diary 
It's not a very detailed diary. It's not the kind of dear diary, today I did this and this and this and I felt terrible about this and this and this. It's not like that at all. It's a very bare record of important events in his day. But he kept this and for a period of nearly 50 years. And all of that material has been fully transcribed and put online with, in a project that was uh, based at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And I can very quickly show you what that looks like. Uh, no, it's not, uh, sorry, I've got the wrong screen. Let me go in here. Okay. So this is the website associated with Godwin Diary, and you can explore it through all sorts of different uh, facets. But you can, these are the kinds of things that he recorded. He recorded interactions with people. He recorded important events. He recorded what he was reading, what he was writing, and he recorded meals, particularly people who shared meals with him. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this is it's a fantastic website if you want to explore any of this stuff. The transcribed diary is there. You can access images of all the originals, and you can also see all this information presented in more or less um, tabular form if you're interested in that stuff. So this is a rich source of data. And as I said, one, one of the bits of information that is stored there, so, oh, sorry, I should mention probably also, the reason I even got interested in this is that um, Monash has had a partnership with the University of Warwick in Britain for 10 years or so now. And at one stage, we were trying to create a shared digital humanities course, which would be taught in this kind of virtual environment before the, everybody had to teach in this kind of virtual environment. And one of the people involved at the Warwick end had been part of the project creating this website, this resource, and we wanted to use it for teaching purposes. So we developed some stuff around the, uh, the material. So Godwin kept track of who ate meals with him, which is a social network, a classic example of a kind of social network or really it's for interrelated networks because there's a network of people who he ate breakfast with. There's a network of people he ate dinner with, tea, supper. In fact, you could say there's eight interrelated networks. He also recorded whether the meal occurred at his house or at somebody else's house. But then there's an interesting question here, I think, which is to what extent do these networks overlap? Or to put it another way, are there people that he ate dinner with but didn't eat breakfast with? Or are there people he only ever ate tea with? And we can look at this through networks. So that's what we're going to look at next. The basic data here comes from um, full XML versions of the diary, which you can download. And you can then use XSLT transformations to get data out, the data about the meals. I already had it on the screen a second ago, but in tabular version presented through the website, this is what you're getting. So it says what the meal is and who the people who were there. That's the essential data I've been working with here. I haven't worried about whether it was at Godwin's home or not. And I haven't worried about the dates, although that actually could be interesting. I'm sure there were people who took part in his life to a greater or lesser extent over time. And that's something that we could also visualize using a network. We would relate people mentioned in Godwin's diary to periods of time and see what kind of network emerged from that. But let's not, <laughs> let's not get too complicated. Now we're just going to look at meals. Who ate meals with William Godwin? And this is the basic data. 
Now, you can see that, for example, there's a listed here, some listed here, Smith, and it's by no means unlikely that Godwin had more than one acquaintance called Smith. But in the XML version, the people who prepared this project did all the hard work and they figured out who all these different people were and where there's ambiguity, they, they've assigned codes to everybody and where there's ambiguity about names, that's resolved. So we, we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so I've got a basic set of data which says, these people had breakfast, these people had supper, these people ate tea together. How are we going to get that to something that can help us answer the question of whether there are different people at different kinds of meals? Well, straightforwardly, we can get a node list, which is the unique codes for the individuals. That's not a problem. Then we need to worry, uh, uh, plus we need nodes for the four meals because we're creating a network that shows the relationships. And then we need to make an edge list, which is going to show which pairs of people were together at which meals. Because we can only, so which people were together at which meals, because we can only relate a person to another entity. And in this case, we're relating people to meals. So we have to read each meal entry and then we have to create pairs of the people who were there. And the result of that is a list of more than 650 people in our node list and more than 15,000 edges. Now, what I'm going to do now to show you that that's maybe interesting, but not very useful. And to do that, I'm going to uh, pop out and show you what it looks like in Gephi. So this is Gephi, and I'm just going to import the list and that's what it gives us as a network, right? So this is huge amount of data but it's not the kind of data, it's not like the social media interactions I spoke about before. It's much messier than that. And when, or it's intermediate, it doesn't have enough patterns will emerge, but it's got too much to see lower level patterns. I said that one of the nice things about Gephi is that you can look at how different algorithms will represent the data. And I'll just show you what that looks like. So, for example, Force Atlas is quite a common algorithm. And all these things, they run until they achieve stability. So they're quite fun to watch. Well, that's even worse. Um, Fruchtum and Rheingold often gives uh, quite good views. Okay, so, I mean, at, at a very exploratory level, what, that, what this shows us is that there's um, a periphery of people who are not very important. And there's a whole lot of stuff at the core that we can't really see clearly, but that's what we're interested in. Okay, so that was partly to show you what a whole lot of data like this looks like and that it's not terribly useful, but also to show you the kind of things that you can do in Gephi, which, as I said, I like. Okay, so let's go back and think about how we can make this more useful. So one of the mathematical properties that we can in we can investigate in networks is what's called centrality. And that's a fancy term talking about what are the important nodes? Not every node, well, in some net networks, every node may be equally important, but in most networks, some nodes 
are more important than others. And centrality gives us ways of mathematically, numerically establishing which ones are more important, more interesting. There are three different ways that um, software like Gephi or iGraph can quantify the centrality measure. The first one is just counting how many edges involve a node. So the idea is, you know, if, if lots of edges, lots of relationships involve that node, it's an important node. Another more sophisticated possibly way of looking at centrality is what's called betweenness centrality. And in, for this, the software has to calculate the shortest paths through the network to get from any node to any other node. And if a node occurs in a lot of those shorter paths, it has high betweenness centrality. So it's linking, it's a part of links between other, uh, other entities which are not necessarily directly linked. And for that reason, it's important. A kind of um, classic example of how betweenness centrality can, you know, an easily graspable example of this is um, Franco, Franco Moretti's network analysis of the play Hamlet where it turns out that Fortinbras is a key character, although he has very few lines, he's the only character who appears in the scenes with the ghost of Hamlet's father and scenes with the current court. So he has very high betweenness centrality. So that's that concept. And there's also eigenvector centrality, which takes account of which first figures out a way to assign weights to nodes and then figures out which nodes are attached or linked to important nodes and gives a weight on that basis. Um, now, as I said, I'm not a complete expert in these matters. For most of the situations I would work with, I would assume that these would come out having basically the same ranking, but there will be situations where they don't, where it matters which one you use. How does this relate to our problem with um, Godwin? Well, it means we can find out who are the most important people, who are the central nodes in the networks. So what I did here is I separated out the data for each meal type and created a graph object for each of them. So the, the entities as nodes and the relationships between them as edges. And then I used eigenvector centralities, found out who were the most important people, and I took the 20 central people from each network. And then I put all of those four groups of 20 together, and of course there's quite a lot of overlap, and ended up with another, created the data for another network. So I made a node table, which was a combination of all the 20, those 20 most central, getting rid of the duplicates, and then used the created edge relationships between them. And then that's something we can start to visualize with. Okay, so now I'm actually going to, as I said, take you under the bonnet and let's go into uh, into R, I'll just load the iGraph package and then I'm going to zip down here to where I, I'm going to load the files I created. The code above is how you get to those. Um, I will organize with Martin that this code is available if anyone wants it. So I'm just loading the two data files. So you see one's called edges and one's called nodes. Then we actually, we have to create the actual graph object. So the software does its magic and we have to, uh, well, we can, we can specify a layout and I'm gonna use the Fruchtemann Rheingold algorithm because for me, it generally gives quite good results. And then we can say, show me that. And there we go, we've got a plot which 
shows the most central people in Godwin's meal networks. Now, this is, uh, I, I've been saying that, you know, this, we get comprehensible plot uh, visualizations out of here, and this is not very comprehensible. So let's see what we can do to make it a bit clearer. The first thing I'm going to do is set the edge widths. Um, I'm going to do a couple of things here and then replot it so you see the effect. What this does effectively is it's, it scales the size of the edges according to how many instances there are. So if there's 15 edges in the edge table between two people, that will be show as a thicker edge than one where there's only four edges between those two people. Um, I'm going to then specify different colors for the people and for the meals so we can separate them easily. And I'm going to get rid of the, uh, the names. I think that's what I'm doing here. Yes, I'm gonna use something else for the labels and specify their size. And now let's see what it looks like. Okay, so this is a bit easier to understand. We can see the four, uh, four meal times. We've still got quite a lot of overlap on the names. We could fiddle around with that some more. And also we can see the weightings of these different nodes. So probably not surprisingly, there's a group of people in the middle here and they're people who shared all four meals with Godwin various times. And in fact, they shared all those meals with him a lot of the time. And when you look in there, you can see that some of them are, that's Mary Shelley. Not surprisingly, his daughter shared a lot of meals with him and all sorts of meals. But then we can also see that, for example, Wordsworth only ever shared breakfast with Godwin, and not that often. Whereas over here, the painter, Henry Fuseli, only ever shared dinner with Godwin, and a little bit more often than Wordsworth had breakfast. So this network is starting to give us answers to the question that we started out with. We can see that there are indeed some people who were dinner guests. There were some people who are tea guests. There are overlaps, but there are distinct groups of people who shared different meals with Godwin. This is not, I'd say, a definitive version of the visualization. I'd like to clean it up and get those names showing a bit more clearly. Um, but I hope at least we've got a sense of where this can get us. Okay, so that, that's a classic social network analysis. Now, what about working with language? It's not immediately obvious, I think, how we can do this, but I want to show you an example of this. Because you know, the basic point here is that networks, the diagrams, they're showing us relationships between entities. So if we get the right kind of entities, we can show linguistic relationships. So it can include what we've just seen, things like relationships between meals and people, but we can think about other kinds of relationships. Um, we can think about different kinds of relationships in one diagram. So it's possible to use different colors on different kinds of edges if you specify in your underlying table that you have different kinds of edges. This is um, not always straightforward. If you start looking through Google or get into Stack Overflow or somewhere like that, there are discussions about showing about how standard software packages will represent multiplexity in networks. Can you show that two entities are linked in two different ways and it's not actually straightforward? But 
people claim it can be done. I've never managed it, but they claim it can be done. But what, we, what I'm going to think about now here is, can we bring this approach onto language? Can we look at even vaguely interesting linguistic pro problems in this way? And what I'm going to look at first is thinking about what words are used in different groups of text and comparing that. Now, if we're looking at just one group of texts, we can get a nice visual representation of characteristic words, important words using word clouds. And you know, people sneer at word clouds, but I think they're really informative, nice graphics. You can learn a lot from. But if you're looking at two different groups of text and you generate a word cloud for each, it's not so easy to compare them. You can see a couple of big words, but the words that are hiding, it's more difficult to track them down and they can be interesting. So it's not an ideal approach, I don't think. We can also use keyword analysis in a corpus package, find out which words are characterize one group of texts rather than the other. But the way you normally present that kind of work is as a table. And that's not always easy to grasp either because you have different factors involved there like frequency and the um, statistical measure of keyness and so forth. And that's not always so easy to grasp either. So, what about if we could do that as a network? Would that be more informative? Well, we can do that. We can model it that way. So let's have a look at that. So what I'm going to look at here is a couple of small samples, which I took from online current affairs sources, a couple of websites, blogs. Um, yeah, I think we can call them both blogs, which have material about current affairs. And this, I have to say, I couldn't immediately track down the date that I assembled this data, but it's at least five years ago. It's from the time uh, when Scott Morrison was Minister for Immigration. And you'll see that in the data. Now, I did some basic pre-processing to clean this data up, including stemming, which is essentially, which for English means chopping off suffixes from words. If I'd been working in more um, time consuming, if I'd been prepared to put more time into it, what I would have done would have been to uh, lemmatize the data so that all words became their root forms and so that, you know, uh, refugee and refugees are treated the same. Now, stemming is the cheap and dirty way of getting the same kind of effect because you chop off the ends of words and then the stems are treated as the same. Uh, when you see the actual things coming up in the data, some of them look a bit weird because of that process, but that's that's what had happened. And out of that, I created what's called a document term matrix, which is just a table of which words occur in which texts and how often. And then I created a no table listing words, and I took 15 occurrences of words as a minimum. Uh, I used a stop list as well, okay, so I'd got rid of articles and common prepositions and so forth. And then I took all the words that occurred more than 15 times. And then created an edge table, which just said which words occur in which group of texts. So it's two groups of texts, and I've got relationships between each word and each group of texts. And again, let's look at this how we're going to how it's actually going to happen. Here we go. So <coughs> let me zip in here and load the data. Which is there. And I'm just going to zip through stuff here because this is just actually creating the tables. Okay, and now we've got down to here. We're going to create the graph object. And let's see what that looks like, just raw. Okay, it's pretty uninformative, right? 
It's just taken the ID numbers for the words and treated them as labels. We can't tell what's a word. We can probably guess that one and two are the two different text collections, but that's all we know. So um, we need to add some labels, which makes life a bit easier. And I'm going to again switch to the Fruchtum and Rheingold algorithm because it gives a better spread. And then I'm going to color the nodes. So now we can so see that these are these are the text collections. They're not words, but it's still hard to see that. Okay, so now it's becoming much clearer. We can see we've got these two groups of texts. We've got some words which occur in both of them. We've got a lot of words that only occur over here. So this was um, Inside Story website. And we've only got, interestingly, only a couple of words which are associated only with this text collection, which was the Independent Australia site from memory. <laughs> and just to make this a little bit more informative, now we'll weight the, um, the edges by frequency of words. So how often did each of these occur? And we can see some words were pretty common, some words not so much. Remember, all of them had at least 15 occurrences. As I said, um, some of these you have to do a little bit of deduction because of the stemming. So I'm guessing that this is um, Senator Payne. But E got chopped off the end of her name by the stemming process. But this is you know, pretty straightforward, but I think this is actually quite an informative way of giving information about what words characterize two different collections of text, what they share, what differentiates them. And on the basis of this kind of information, we could start making hypotheses about discourse strategies in these texts. <laughs> what different points of view the two sources were trying to put forward or reflected and so forth. And I, I hope that you share my view that this is more comprehensible, more informative than looking at a pair of word clouds or a table of keywords. Okay. Now, I'm gonna talk, as I said, Start, I'm going to talk about a couple more examples, but fairly briefly. I'm not going to go into the same level of detail. I'm just going to say these are other things that I've done with networks related to linguistic research, which might not have seemed so obvious, but actually turned out to be really informative and useful. <clears throat> so these are not necessarily working directly with language data, although the first example I'm going to look at is rather similar in some ways. But they're looking at relationships between kinds of entities relevant in linguistic research or in the research that I was doing. Other people may not find it so interesting. Um, as I said at the start, you know, when we think in linguistics about networks, we typically think about sociolinguistic research. And if you're working in those terms, these packages are useful also. You can get great visualizations. You can also get some of the kind of information that sociolinguists rely on. So these will, packages will standardly give you calculations of network density. And as I said, you can get some multiplexity in there, but it's a bit tricky. But there's quite a lot of material online about how you can approach the problem. Okay, so what am I gonna look at here? First thing I'm gonna look at is lexical choices of a kind again, but a more complex situation. And then I've got an example of looking for patterns in behavior, which is not actually linguistic, but it's based on language. And that turns out to be really interesting. So first thing here is um, I became interested at some point in grammar writing. Um, 
my colleague Nick Teberger and I, we've been working for a long time on problems of putting grammatical description online. And in the course of that, I've become very aware of some issues around how grammars get written. And one particular question that I got fascinated with was, when you write a grammatical description, how much does your background in various areas influence what you do? Are the analytical concepts that you use highly dependent on aspects of your background or are they driven by the data that you're looking at? So in the end, I think the question that I was looking at here is are the communities of practice in writing grammatical description and what might be the basis for those kinds of communities of practice if they exist? So I, I constructed a preliminary study of this problem and I looked at three different variables. First of all, I looked at what kind of language was being described and I was aware, I mean, I, you don't want to be going to these kinds of things with prejudged opinions, but I was pretty sure, I was aware that people who work in different language families have different theoretical vocabularies. Some phenomena only occur in certain language families, and so to that extent, you expect to find people talking about them and not talking about them when they're looking at other language families. But even for things that are across language families, I had a strong hunch that people talked about them in different ways. So I looked at contrast between a subgroup of Indo-European, the Indo-Aryan subgroup, and a subgroup of the Austronesian language family, Oceanic. Then I was interested in training. Um, I think most people who look at um, descriptive linguistics I would probably think that people from America often have different, um, <clears throat> different ways of talking about things than people from Europe or elsewhere. So I made that a variable. I looked at who had a PhD awarded in the USA, who had a PhD awarded in Europe. And I also wondered if it was possible to see that these things changed over time. Um, because of the way I actually constructed the study and got the data, which I'll explain in a second, it was difficult to get a big time scale here. <coughs> so it ended up being stuff published before 2000 versus stuff published after 2000, which is not really satisfactory. But I'll tell you why in a second. So what kind of data are we looking at here? Um, so I've got three, three binary variables, which gives you a data matrix with eight cells. I put two instances in each cell. So I was looking at 16 grammatical descriptions. And the way I got my data was I looked at, so a grammatical description pretty standardly has a list of the abbreviations which are used in glossing examples. So things like, an abbreviation for singular, an abbreviation for plural, an abbreviation for past tense, an abbreviation for perfect aspect, these kinds of things. So I looked at those lists of abbreviations and I got a list result of that was from my 16 grammars was a list of 514 concepts. Some of those I could collapse. Some of them I judged that, although they'd use slightly different term, terms, slightly different abbreviations, they were actually talking about the same thing. So I was fairly conservative about that. I didn't get too gung-ho. I wanted to preserve as much variety as I could, but I got rid of about 100 items on that basis. And then of those 400 odd, more than 250 were only used by one author which in itself is actually interesting. So um, in 16 grammars, the authors, roughly speaking, had 15 concepts that they thought were unique to the language. 
that they couldn't use somebody else, a term that other people had used. <coughs> so they were uninteresting from my point of view. I got rid of them and I was left with 138 items for my analysis. And I did basically the same thing that I just shown you with my two groups of blog posts. I'm looking at what a kind of lexical choices, choose choices of terms in groups of texts. And I can group my texts in three different ways. So what do the results look like? This is what it looks like for the comparison by language family. There's quite a lot of stuff that's shared between the two, but there are terms which are out there at either the top or the bottom, which are used only in describing one of these groups of languages and not at all for the other. And of those, as it says, there's 27 that were only used to describe oceanic languages, and 17 that were only used to describe Indo-Aryan languages. There's stuff that's shared, but there's, there is some separation. So, I mean, the next question would be, is it that these things are only relevant in one fa language family, or is it just that they're talking about them in different ways? And looking at some of these, it's not hard to think that, you know, this is just a matter of different terminologies. If you come from a different tradition, you use different terms. So for example, animate and inanimate are used by Indo-Aryanists, but not, not Oceanists, but the distinction certainly exists in Oceanic languages. So it's probably being tracked using different terms. Same with um, realis. Oceanic languages have a, a realis irrealis distinction, but the grammars that I looked at weren't using that terminology. So there is, you know, there's definitely separation happening on this one. Um, and also the separation depending on training. So, and this, you know, this goes across the language families. This is just about where someone got their PhD. And European trained scholars, there's 21 terms that are exclusive to them, 19 exclusive to the Americans. So again, there's definitely separation. And some of these, you can see that they, again, it, it has to be a dif difference in terminology. People are talking about PPs here. PPs exist for European linguists, but they're not using that as a term. So again, your background makes a difference. Um, as I said, the, I wasn't really happy about the time span. And the, the reason for this, why this is really a short time span is that fully glossed examples as a feature of descriptive grammars don't really exist before the 1970s. And even then they're a little bit um, sporadic. It's only quite recently that this has been standard practice. I had wondered if there would be an effect from um, the Leipzig glossing rules, which were promulgated early in the 2000s. I thought it was possible that that would have affected what happened after 2000 but there's really not any clear evidence in this visualization to suggest that that was the case or that it made a huge difference whether you looked at one or the other. Okay, so that was an example of a kind of, <laughs> what's, I was gonna say metalinguistic, but it's not even metalinguistic, it's meta-metalinguistic really, investigation, looking at, how people talk about languages and what their back, how their background might influence that. And as I said, that was a preliminary study. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to take that any further. I'd love to. I'd really like to pick up some of these questions and examine them in more detail. Um, I hope I might find some time. The second question I'm going to look at here relates to multilingual borrowing in a public library. And this was part of a research project which uh, I had at Monash with my colleague from linguistics, Louisa Willoughby, and two colleagues from the IT faculty, Steve Wright and Tom Dennison. 
And we were looking at a public library in a suburban area of Melbourne, the city of Dandenong, which is southeast of the centre of Melbourne. It's about another 10 kilometres further in, from Mon. If you go past Monash and keep going for another 10k or so, you're getting into the city of Dandenong. And it's one of the most culturally and linguistically diverse regions in Greater Melbourne. The library is a fantastic institution and they are really responsive to their community. And they have collections in from memory 29 languages. And they review that over time. If um, languages are being less used in their municipality, they will drop them and they will replace them with languages of new communities. So it's a really interesting example of how languages, uh, how libraries can respond to a multilingual situation. Now, one thing that immediately interested us when we started looking at the data, so we, we got a, a nice data dump from the library of borrowing transa transaction records for a year, which was uh, like a million transactions. There's a lot of data, particularly interesting. So this is a digression, but it's fascinating. Um, I presented on some of this material to a Monash internal forum, which included several people from the Monash University Library. And one of them told me afterwards that for that year, the city of Dandenong Library had more physical transactions than the Monash University Library, which shows us the direction that university research libraries are moving, that you know, everything is online. We don't borrow stuff physically anymore. Okay, so we got this data, we started looking at it. And one thing that was really interesting was that there were quite a lot of people who borrowed in more than one language. Now you'd say, okay, that makes sense. People will borrow in English and the language another language that they grew up with or that they knew. But it was more complex than that. There was more going on than just that. It wasn't just English and other things. It was, in some cases, English and quite a lot of other things. And sometimes it was just, well, I think pretty much everybody had some English, but it was more than just English and one other language. We didn't directly have access to information about individual borrowers because the way the library's database was set up, it didn't, it protected that information. But we managed to approximate. And on that basis, we identified, we thought 166 patrons who borrowed material in English and four or more other languages. And that's you know, that's a big repertoire of languages for individuals. There were a couple, a few, four people, we, as far as we could identify them. These were the, you know, the limiting cases who used English and eight other languages. Now, some of this we figure is actually an, um, an artifact of parenting. <laughs> So, you know, these people, look, we're looking at English and eight other languages, which might include four different scripts. And we figure that actually what's going on is not that there are fabulous um, multi-polyglot borrowers in Dandenong, but that parents go in with their kids and their kids are picking books on the basis of pictures. And they don't really care <laughs> what script or language the text is. That's our best explanation. We didn't actually get into detail and analyzing if it was children's picture books that were being borrowed. But nevertheless, you know, this is quite surprising level, we thought, of borrowing by people in varied languages. And we were interested to see if there were any patterns going on in that. Come on. So, you know, we, the question basically we want to know is, were some combinations of languages that people borrowed in more common than others? We knew that English was going to be involved with lots of them, but if someone borrowed English and Chinese, what other languages might they borrow? 
We were particularly interested, they have, um, this is an area with a former Yugoslavian Balkan population, and there's complex issues around script, Cyrillic versus Roman, whether you're calling something Serbian or Croatian. We were interested if there was borrowing going on across those kinds of divides, but just generally what's going on, what kind of patterns might we find? So the way that we looked at this was to do some network analysis. We treated languages as nodes, pairs of languages that people borrowed became edges, and then we visualized what's going on. So, you know, if someone's borrowing material in three languages that generated three edges, four languages would generate a slightly higher number. I'm not gonna calculate it on the fly, but we, we produced all those edges and then looked at the network. And this is what it looks like. As we'd expect, you know, English is co-borrowed with everything else. And it's a pretty heavy, so we, you know, the edges are weighted here and it's pretty strong, but there's lots and lots of other stuff going on. You can see, for example, that between Croatian and Serbian in Roman script, there's quite a strong connection. Not surprising, but still worth knowing. Whereas between Croatian and Serbian in Cyrillic script and Serbian in Roman script, not so much. So the, the distinction in script is important there. And then there's like Croatian and Punjabi, you know, what's going on? Spanish connected to lots of different things. We thought that um, there might be quite strong connections amongst some of the Asian languages and Vietnamese and Chinese, there is a little bit because um, although the, there's a substantial proportion of the Vietnamese community in this area, like in most of Australia, Quite a lot of people are actually ethnic Chinese, although they've come from Vietnam. And so it's not surprising if they use both. Um, French and German, strong connection. But as you can see, the, the, you know, the basic point here is oh, and also um, Hindi and Tamil connection there. Um, a basic point though, was we can see that what kind of patterns there are here, what kind of relationships there are in a way that it would be quite difficult to map using other techniques. And it was pretty straightforward to get to this visualization. So again, I think this is a nice example of the kind of stuff that network analysis can aid in presenting interesting results. Okay, so I'm going to wind up because I, I think I've talked for plenty, oh, quite long enough. Um, so I'll just wind up by mentioning a couple of possibilities I've been considering. So, and I'm, I'm hoping to encourage you to think about these possibilities as well. As I've said a couple of times, you know, we can, networks can help us look at, at any kind of relationships between any kinds of entities. And in this case, the entities can be any kind of unit that might be relevant to the analyses we're doing. So very quickly. Um, I have a PhD student at Monash uh, who's looking at, she is a working medical interpreter and she is investigating aspects of medical interpreting. Her name is Bissaka Sula and the main supervisor here is actually Jim Plavats. And the kind of central idea that we're looking at, that Bissa is looking at in this research is in principle, an interpreter should speak 50% of the time in an interpreted interaction because they're going to repeat everything that each of the other parties says. So it's assuming there's two other parties. Actually, many of these interactions have a third, another, like the person who accompanied the patient. But that's the basic idea. But actually, that, that doesn't happen. Um, and one reason, this is what Bees is really interested in, is that patients, when they can, will use the doctor's language to the extent that they can. 
And then the examples we're looking at, that's always English. So even if patients feel that they need an interpreter at the consultation, and for some parts of it, they need that interpretation, that interpreting happening, when they can work with English, with the English that they have, they'll do that. And of course, that means that the interpreter does less work, which is why that 50% figure just doesn't happen. So how could this networks be interesting here? Well, one interesting question is, where do the patients use their non-preferred language, in this case, English, in relation to the stages of the interaction? So a way of investigating this would be to treat this as a network. So we'd look at the stages of the consultation, and there are you know, good models of how this genre is staged. And then we could look at language choice by term for each of those stages as nodes, uh, as, yeah, as nodes and relate them. So then we could plot a network and we could see patients use English a lot in the introductory, let's get to know each other session, because really that just means being able to say, hello, or how are you? But when we get to say, giving instructions about medication in that kind of part of the interaction, we would expect that we're gonna see a lot lower level of patients using English because that's more complex information and it's more important that they get it exactly right. Okay, so we haven't done this. We've got some numbers about the distribution of language choice across stages of the consultation. But um, I think this was some, it would be interesting to model it as a network. It would, I think we might get some interesting things showing up there. And I might try to convince Pisa to do it. She's got plenty of other stuff to do though. But I just, you know, thinking about it, it seems like it's something that could be worth doing. And a second quick example, and this relates to research that Michael and I have been doing over a period. Um, and this is the idea that if we want to locate lots of examples of some pragmatic phenomena, the only, the most effective way to do that is by looking for complex combinations of things going on. So what we're calling combinatorial searches. <laughs> so this is the idea that you know, some kind of pragmatic event might be signaled by a lexical choice and relationship with a turn change and relationship with some international feature or something like that. We're at a very preliminary stage, right? We're only getting a sense of what the possibilities might be in this space. But one way, oh, sorry, okay. So an example, you know, which we have written about is the use of um, laughter. Well, I think we characterized it as awkward laughter to, as a kind of repair strategy for certain situations. And it's to do with, we found it can be to do with a turn change and then a long pause. And then someone has kind of nervous laughter, which is, oh, let's try and get this back on track. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. As I said, this is very, we're only starting to think about how this might work, but I think one possible exploratory strategy that might be interesting would be to choose a range of kinds of events and then model them as a directed network. So if event, event X, the edges then would indicate that an event of one kind precedes an event of another kind. And what would be interesting here is I think that this, if you model this as a network, and it's directed, you will get to see sequences of things which occur. And they would be interesting. Finding out if you do this and then you do this and then you do this, what kind of pragmatic significance does that have? And is that a useful thing to search for? That sequence would be, I think, an interesting result. I warned Michael that I was going to talk about this, but this is the first time he's heard any of these ideas. And I hope he's interested, but it's, it's you know, it's, I think this is the kind of 
creative approach that we can take to using networks as a tool in our linguistic research. Thank you for your attention. As I said, I've spoken for too long.